Well, hey, biology, I hope you're doing well when you watch this video. So I'm going to try to take you through um, basically chapter one. Um, I'm going to be asking you various questions that I want you to answer and email me. Um, remember, this PowerPoint is also posted in files on Teams, so you want to make sure you download it and fill in some of the notes or at least delete some of the boxes that I have hiding some of the notes for, you know, obviously we have taken in class. So make sure you find the PowerPoint on Microsoft Teams that's on files. And yeah, so let's go ahead and get started. So biology is all about the study of life, but what makes something alive is a good question to begin with. So if I were to ask you, are rocks alive? Most of you would probably say, oh, you know, all of you probably would say, no, of course not. But could you describe why? Could you describe why they're not alive? And what about water? Is water alive? I mean, we need water to live, but is water alive? And the, the answer is also no. This is uh, an electron microscope. It's color been added for our enhancement, but this is actually COVID, this virus right here. And would you consider COVID, the coronavirus, COVID-19, to be alive? I mean, it's obviously affecting living things, but is it alive? And so with that being said, viruses are actually on the threshold of life. They, do, they have many qualities of life, but not all of them. So we would say a virus is not technically alive according to biology. So your first question, I'm going to highlight these questions in yellow so you can kind of go back and see what's going on. But your first question is, is an apple alive? And I also want you to tell me why or why not. Okay, describe that for me. Make sure you've also signed and emailed the syllabus to me. All these questions are due um, the next time we meet. Okay, so if you think about it, lots of living things are on the planet, of course, and life interacts. I mean, we have bird flus. We obviously have the seasonal flu coming up, influenza. We have parasites that could possibly live in us. Um, illegal drugs experience permanent damage to the brains and nervous system. We, you know, there's been efforts to clone humans. So all of this is biology or the study of life. So bios means life and logos means study of. So geology, for example, would mean the study of the earth. Geo means earth. So what characteristics do all living things possess? And that is the following. So you want to be able to make sure you can say this, like memorize it, okay? So first off, building things are made up of cells. Secondly, we have a universal genetic code. Universal means life shares it. This is DNA. I'll talk to you a little bit more about it in a second. We obtain and use materials and energy. Hopefully you've eaten um, when you watch this video. But we have to eat. We have to um, get those building blocks to make ATP energy for our cells. You're growing and developing, and we constantly are growing and developing throughout our lives. We're replacing tissue. Um, you know, cells are being uh, dividing. Stem cells are reproducing uh, functional specialized cells. So we're definitely always needing nutrition to grow and develop. We reproduce as a species, of course, to procreate and allow our species to exist. We respond to the environment. Some of our classrooms at school are really cold, right? So some of you start shivering or, hey, can you turn the thermostat up? But it is a response. You, you don't choose to shiver, but we just respond to the environment. We maintain a stable internal environment, which is also called homeostasis. I'll talk to you more about that in a second. And then finally, living things change over time. That's evolution. There are lots of things. Remember, we're at a Christian school, so I want you to know that evolution, there's a lot of truth to evolution. Um, of course, we wouldn't believe, according to the Bible, that humankind came from like this you know, ape-like individual. Most Christians wouldn't believe that. But evolution, you know, there's a lot of truth to it. Things change, things adapt, especially within the kinds that God created. So biology is the study of life. And these are the characteristics of life. So we're just going to kind of walk through these a little bit together. So the first one I want to really hone in on is DNA. You have roughly 3 billion letters, or, you know, for our purposes, letters right now, in your genetic code. That code makes up you. And we all have different codes, but this is DNA. So living things are based on a universal genetic code. This is the building block. This is the blueprint that makes you, you. Second thing, living things grow and develop, which we already talked about. You know, you were once one single cell, and now you have trillions of cells in your body. A lot of them are doing completely different things. Your muscle cells have acted in myosin and allowing you to contract. Your nervous system cells actually send rapid fire signals, running a small little voltage. Um, there's cells in your eyes that are completely transparent, so you can let light in to see. 
Living things also respond. So what do we respond to? We respond to something called a stimulus. A stimulus is a signal to which we respond. For example, some plants produce unsavory chemicals to ward off tadpoles that feed on their leaves. Fun little fact here, but caffeine is actually one of those chemicals that plants produce to protect themselves. We use caffeine, obviously, to get a burst of energy when we stayed up too late gaming and we need to study. But nonetheless, caffeine is, is something that we need, um, not necessarily need, but plants use to defend themselves against possible herbivores that would possibly eat them and kill them. Um, so caffeine is developed for that. So let me show you a couple of pictures here. First off, if you're walking in the woods and you saw this picture right here, your body would automatically start doing a couple of things. <laughs> your body would go, your sympathetic system and your, um, your nervous system would fire up. And that's fight, flight, or freeze. They've added freeze. Some people debate if freeze should be in there or not. But nonetheless, your blood pressure is going to skyrocket. Your heart is start, start going to pounding. Why? Because your body is going to prepare you to fight for your life. Now, of course, if you see a bear, don't run in the woods. Let me just give you some practical advice here. They say, speak calmly, stand your ground, let it know you're a human. Um, you know, they used to say be loud, but I don't think the wildlife services say that anymore. But just stand your, stand your ground, be calm. There's that crazy video where the, where the bear was like sniffing a lady's hair and she remained completely calm and she lived. So yeah, just don't, don't do anything crazy. Don't run. They'll chase you thinking you're easy prey. If you're really hungry around lunchtime and you, and you smell a hamburger cooking with bacon and you see it, you're going to start salivating because your body's like, man, it's time to eat. And you're going to start making enzymes in your mouth to increase the process of digestion. So all that is an example of responding to stimulus. Living things reproduce. Two types of reproduction, sexual and asexual. Sexual, of course, is the uh, uniting of the two sex cells, sperm and egg. And then asexual is done when the parent just produces a clone of itself. Like when it says identical, it just means a clone. So this can be done through binary fission. It can be done through budding. Um, it can be done through regeneration, like some starfish, can, you know, you can cut off a certain, you know, you have to cut a certain way, but sometimes they can grow into two whole organisms if they're cut in half. And so that is an example of asexual reproduction. Not only that, living things also have to be able to maintain a stable internal environment. So I want you definitely to highlight or make note of this word, but this is a huge theme word, core word in biology, homeostasis, the ability to maintain a stable internal environment. Crazy important. This is why if you have too high of a fever for too long, you will die because you're not maintaining a stable internal environment. And you're doing this with all sorts of stuff. Blood sugar levels. Um, you know, when you do blood tests, they're going to measure levels of all sorts of things, hormone levels. Um, you know, white blood cell counts, you know, red blood cell counts. There's, there's ranges within your body for pretty much everything that you need to live. And so that's homeostasis. For example, these are pictures of stomata and plants, specialized cells, guard cells, open and close them. And plants need CO2 in, but when they're open, they also lose water vapor. So plants have to decide, hey, is it, has it rained? Do I need more water? And some plants in the desert have specialized adaptations to allow them to survive in those really arid conditions. Um, the next one, we, we need to be able to use material and energy to grow, develop, and reproduce. This is called metabolism. I don't know if you ever heard someone like say, like, oh, she has a fast metabolism, or he has a fast metabolism, and they can eat a whole tub of ice cream and lose weight. But metabolism is actually, everybody has a pretty great, amazing, quick metabolism because it's basically the combination of all chemical reactions. Yes, it's true that some people process foods differently, of course, but this is called metabolism. So we have to get material and energy to be able to carry out all these chemical reactions that are happening in our body. We have to eat. You die if you don't eat in a couple of weeks. So living things are made up of one or more cells. Cell biology is a course in college if you go into the sciences. Cell biology, the smallest living thing is a cell. The cell is a basic unit of life. So all the properties of life that we're talking about, cells have. And because cells are alive, you're alive. And then finally, organisms change or evolve over time. We've seen this in viruses. We've seen this in bacteria. You know, all these superbugs are resistant to all these antibiotics. Um, human skulls have changed over time, like we've lost some teeth <laughs> because our food's a lot more, you know, squishy and stuff instead of like the hard grain that our ancestors used to eat. I mean, dogs weren't on Noah's Ark. Golden Retrievers were bred in like 
you know, Ireland or, or somewhere, Scotland or something like that in like the 1700s, 1800s. So things change over time. And the Bible doesn't have an issue with that because the Bible says that God created according to kinds, if you read it in Genesis 1, according to kinds. Um, and so we'll talk way more about that later. So why does this matter? Why does all this matter? Well, here's a guy sneezing, and hence why we're wearing masks. That's just imagine breathing all that in. That's that's fun. Um, but you, if you ever been to the doctor, I I um I know some people uh, that man when they get sick they have to take an antibiotic. But sometimes they're they're not infected with a with a bacterial infection, which would be something alive. They have a viral infection, and so if you take antibiotics. It actually doesn't help you at all. It actually makes you worse, usually, because you're not only not treating the viral infection, but you're also destroying all your great bacteria in your gut that's helping you defend yourself. So it matters because we need to know what's alive and what's not alive to, to correctly treat sometimes illnesses. So here's a couple of other questions I want you to, um, to do for me, okay? So the first, the second question, so I've already asked you what, what makes an apple alive. Um, the second thing that I want you to do is I want you to answer the question, you know, give me a question. What is a question within the scope of this course that could be answered using scientific inquiry? So what's something that you could use in scientific inquiry? Let me highlight all this for y'all so you can like see that these are questions you need to answer. Um, you know, like scientific method, you know, observation, make an hypothesis, data. What's a question that you could ask that actually could be studied by using science? Once you also answer kind of a silly, simple question, but it help, it'll help you think about it. What enables a squirrel to climb a tree? Sorry, there should be an A there. Let me fix that. Climb a tree. Wow. And then how does the Bible define life? You'll find that life in the Bible uh, is differentiated between physical and spiritual. So how does the Bible define life? So the first couple of objectives, other than staying what makes something alive, is also to understand the goals of science. And so there was this case study done. You can look up videos about this, but HGH is called human growth hormone. And so sometimes children aren't growing correctly. There's growth charts and stuff, and they're not. They're just not growing. They're they're really low on the growth chart. Their weight's low. Their height's low. Wingspan, all sorts of things. And so sometimes they'll do studies, and they'll find that they're low in this hormone called human growth hormone. And so um, the pituitary gland is not making enough for some reason, which is a gland at the base of your brain. So it also helps, you know, regulate all sorts of things. Human growth hormone, muscle and bone growth, sugar and fat metabolism. It's a crazy important um, hormone. So if your child was too low, if you were too low, would you agree to treatment? And most people would be like, yeah, sure, of course. You know, I mean, if it's going to help us. But of course, there's always side effects in medicine. But what about if you were healthy, but you just wanted an advantage? What if you were healthy, but you were never going to grow to like six nine, so you want and you want to play basketball? What if you were healthy, but you want an advantage on a sports field? And obviously, this happens all the time. You know, athletes have in the past, and will continue to do so to try to find things to take that gives them an advantage. Um, this is something I want you to keep in mind because we're going to talk about HGH in this case study for a while. So there's this, there's done social studies, and this would be a video I showed you in class, but they've done social studies and social experiments where. You know, if you're standing by a woman and her purse is stolen, would you try to chase the subject down? Would you try to do that? Um, or would you just kind of let the purse <laughs> snatch her go? And, and so here's what science though can tell us. Science can't tell us about morality, okay? Science can't tell us if something is right or wrong. And so I want you to make note of that. Science only tells us about natural explanations. We're, we're trying to understand the natural world, and that's based upon facts and evidence. We also want to understand patterns in nature to make useful predictions about natural events. So first off, science can't tell me about morality. That's based on faith, your worldview, your ethics. Science can only tell you about a situation, not if it's right or wrong. Secondly, science only talks about natural, um, the natural world. In the Bible, there's a lot of supernatural events, right? Jesus walking on the water, Jesus feeding 4,000 and 5,000 men along with their families um, two, two different times. Jesus stopping a funeral procession and raising a uh, only son of, of a mother's, you know, he was dead and he raised him to life. Of course, Lazarus and of course him rising from the dead himself. He has power to give his life and power to raise his life back up. And so that's all supernatural events. The Old Testament creation, the flood, you know, splitting of, you know, the um, Sea of Reeds and the Israelites walking through on dry land. All that's supernatural events. Some people try to describe it naturally, but 
nonetheless, that's not our argument right now or what we're talking about. We're talking about the science is dealing with natural events. And so what's, cra what's crazy about science is because the more we know, the more it changes, right? So some of the things that you will learn, I guarantee you, within the next couple of years as far as science goes, there'll be questions, especially in college, right? You know, with some of the, you know, um, on the forefront of knowledge, you're, you're gonna, some of these things are gonna change. So, so if they haven't already. So scientific ideas are always open to testing, discussion. Science is a way of gathering and analyzing evidence. So whales communicate. We can we can study that. We can analyze it. How far do they travel? Why do they travel? Are they going for food? Are they going for mates? Are they going to give birth? What do we do that? So I want you to think about this before we start talking about scientific method. I want you to start thinking about science is a way of knowing. I'm doing this with a mouse. I don't have like one of those writing pads, so you'll have to forgive me if it's not perfectly circular, which it's not, but I didn't connect with there we go. Um, what does it mean? A way of knowing. So science. The science um, method, and y'all probably know this from previous courses, but nonetheless, science doesn't go in a linear pattern, which means it doesn't go in a straight line. Like I have to do A, then I have to do B, then I have to do C. Science is actually very fluid, and it's a way of knowing. And so science involves, first off, observing and asking questions. Scientists are always asking questions and observing. That's what scientists do. We're very curious by nature. We also make inferences, which is like using previous knowledge to, to understand the world. We form hypotheses. I don't want you to think educated guess there. I want you to think of a prediction. Think about, you know, we research, we use our inferences, and we predict what we think will happen. Conducting controlled experiments to, under, to, to find patterns, to find trends, to better understand the natural world. Obviously, we collect data, and then we conclude and draw conclusions and analyze that data so some people are confused by the terms inference and observation and inference observation is just like you're you're noticing something like if i notice a car running a red light i'm a police officer okay that's an easy ticket but if i'm inferring inferring is interpretation based on what scientists already know so the one of the ways i like to teach about infer inferences is god forbid of course but you go home and you see this what would you infer and, you know, most people say like, oh, my, you know, my house has been broken into. It's been kicked in. You can see that it's been kicked in or, or you know, um, damaged somehow so to let someone in. True. But, I mean, why couldn't it be a bear? Why couldn't it be a big animal? Why couldn't it be the mailman just desperate to get packages in the door? Of course, that's ridiculous. But all those are inferences based upon your previous knowledge. So you, you don't see a, sub, a suspect. You don't see an animal. You don't really see... All you see is the, the, the evidence, you see the scene, and you infer what's happening. So that's, you're using your previous knowledge. Um, so there's two different variables in scientific, um, you know, scientific experiments. There's an independent variable, which means I change. I want you to kind of like underline I, I change. And then there's a dependent variable, which is, means what we measure. So for example, if I'm testing out a certain species of, of bacteria, E. coli, a certain strain of E. coli, and I'm wondering what temperature does this species of bacteria grow best at? And I'm doing like 20 degrees Celsius, 25 degrees Celsius, 30 degrees Celsius, 35, 40. You know, there's different, there's ranges, right? And I'm measuring how well the bacteria responds, how well it grows. Does it cover the Petri dish? Are they like, or are they dying? What's going on? Well, the independent variable in that experiment would be the temperature. I am changing the temperature. So what's the dependent variable? The dependent variable is what I am measuring. So I'm measuring bacterial growth, okay? So the next thing that I want you to do is here's a question, and I want you to design an experiment. So let me explain this to you. But I want you to kind of test out hypothetically, how would you handle and carry out an experiment that deals with this question? Does the amount of sleep a student gets affect how well that student does in school? So I need to know an hypothesis. Tell me an hypothesis that you have, and then tell me how you would carry out that you know, study. Would you have multiple different groups? Would one group be sleeping a certain amount of time? Would another group be sleeping another amount of time? How would you test your results, though? Would they be in the same class? Would they take the same test? How long would you carry your experiment out? All these are questions to think about in science. You know, what are we doing in the experiment? How long? How many different groups do we have? What are the groups doing? 
um, especially for this kind of study. So I want you to think about that and just type that out for me, okay? And it doesn't have to be crazy long. I'm just trying to help us understand how to think in a scientific way. So one more time, does the amount of sleep a student gets affect, how, how does the amount of sleep a student get affect how well that student does in school, okay? So in science, there's a couple of scientific attitudes that we have to have. In order to be a good scientist, you have to be curious just naturally curious about the world around you. Um, skeptical, talk about skepticism here in a second. Open-minded, you know, open to learning new ideas and then creative. We have to come up with ways of solving problems. So first off, curiosity. There's actually a rover on Mars called Curiosity, taking amazing pictures, one of the greatest inventions in NASA space travel. Albert Einstein, debatably one of the smartest men to ever, ever lived. I have no special talents. This is Albert Einstein talking. I'm only passionately curious. And of course, the great children's book, Curious George. Um, so yeah, that's that's an that's an issue. Let me, if this video plays, I'd like to show you this video. I don't know if it's going to or not. Oh, sweet, let's do it. And so you've seen this video and you be like, what? loss you know history we um people bought these machines i forgot exactly when 40s 50s 60s somewhere around there and they literally believe you could stand there and let the machine shake the weight off of you some of you may know someone who has a machine like this in their attic or something like that i mean i'm sure they're worth some money now but i you know would you automatically believe that or would you be skeptical um, for example, if someone said, hey, you can eat cookies every day and lose weight, would you be like, sweet, let me go to, you know, the grocery store and get me some, give me some cookies for breakfast, lunch, and dinner. What about someone says, hey, take this medication, it'll make you feel better. You automatically believe, or you like, well, is there any other choices? Is there any holistic approaches? You're like, and you're like, well, this is all ridiculous. I mean, the land that we live in, you know, people are always telling the truth. Well, actually, 2013, these Sensa crystals right here. <laughs> Literally, they had to pay out around a million dollars to sell false advertising claims because what they argued is these crystals, they were like, hey, spread these crystals out on whatever you eat. And because they're on the food, they'll make you feel fuller faster so you won't eat as much so you'll lose weight. But it was not tested by science. It was not proved by science. And it was completely false, completely a sham. And But people literally, I mean, million, like millions of dollars people bought of this stuff because it sounds great like i can eat pizza and just sprinkle sensor crystals on it and lose weight amazing let's make it happen captain and so of course it, it you know for this instance it wasn't true acne cream you want to make sure it works right or are you just going to naturally just believe someone um t telling you something so technology science and society are all closely linked and you probably have seen this especially in the world we live in now right science and it seems like science and you know kind of it's been a little bit politicized um but true scientists, just show me the data, right? There's a certain drug out that's helping COVID. Show me the data. Show me the show me the studies. Show me the peer-reviewed articles. Um, COVID affects a certain age group more than another. Show me the data, right? Children aren't affected. Show me the data, right? It's not we don't we try not to get political, but unfortunately everybody, and at least it seems like everybody has an agenda. Everybody is a little bit biased towards something. But true science, show me the data. Show me show me show me the facts. Technology, science, and society are all closely linked. So we share ideas, we ask questions, we find, we explore, and it's all linked. So remember HGH, like if you were low and you uh, needed it? Well, in the past, it was really hard to find. Much the same like insulin. Living things make HGH, living things make the hormone insulin. But yet, back in the past, there's no way to get that. So people actually literally had to take it from cadavers, which are dead human bodies, or animals. And of course, infection rates were high because good grief, right? And so, but that, but now it's made, literally it's made, it's made through biotechnology. <laughs> we, we usually use bacteria. We, we, we biologically engineer bacteria. We insert the gene for HGH. We insert the gene for insulin into bacteria. They make this protein and we extract it from these large vats. Um, you large containers, we purify it, and then we inject it. I mean, insulin's crazy cheap. Diabetes used to be a death sentence.
But now because insulin's crazy cheap, you know, people live a long time with diabetes. I mean, HDH, really hard to get. Now, I mean, back in the, you know, you know, decades ago, um, people, athletes took HDH to, to get, you know, bigger, faster, stronger. But HDH is now readily able to be received and, and treated. So in science, we communicate our results. Um, I don't know the latest data on, but there was a result coming out of Russia about them having some great drug to treat COVID or, but no one was really believing them because there was no published data on it. Science is an open forum. It's good science is. We're not, you know, unfortunately there's so much, you know, there is some, you know, well, where's the money? Where's the profit? What's in it for us? But a lot of scientists and a lot of organizations are like, no, here, test it out. We want to help people as quickly as possible. And so it's important to, to communicate results because we need as many minds on as possible to avoid bias. In science, some vernacular that we need to understand how to say correctly is theory versus law. A law just states something will happen, like the law of gravity. Okay, it's very straightforward, law of gravity. Uh, another law, law of thermodynamics, right? For every action, there is an I equal and opposite reaction. But in science, theories are more complicated. They explain, they're more wordy, I guess. That's not really a word, but they, they have a deeper explanation because they, it's not true, like completely, you know, as far as like provable because there's things that we don't understand, but it is backed by a lot of science. So for example, theory of evolution, theory of plate tectonics, the cell theory, um, big bang theory, right? A TV show, but also like according to atheistic naturalistic science, how everything came into being from nothing. But all those are theories. They're backed by a lot of science. They're backed by a lot of evidence. But there's things that we don't understand about them. And so we're trying to, you know, and, and we aren't sure about everything. So that's why they're a theory and not a law. So science, ethics, and morality, they all also kind of intersect a little bit. So science explain why about natural phenomena. But it doesn't include ethical or moral viewpoints. For example, you know, a tragic one in our society and around the world. Science can explain when a baby's heart beats. Science can explain if a baby feels pain. Science in, in, inside the womb, a developing, you know, fetus. Science can explain uh, fertilization and reproduction and all that. But science can explain the process of abortion, you know, what happens. But true science can't explain whether that's right or wrong. That's a worldview. That's a belief. That's based upon your principles and your ethics and your uh, religious beliefs um, and what you view about life and the unborn. But true science can't tell you about ethical and moral viewpoints. We can just tell you the why, the facts. Okay. So, for example, you know, science, biologists try to explain scientific life what it is. But we can't tell you why life exists. According to the Bible, it's for God's glory. Or what the meaning of life is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever, according to Westminster, um, uh, Westminster Catechism. So, science wants to avoid something called bias. Bias is a particular point of view that you're not open minded about, you're very closed off with. Sometimes scientific data can be misinterpreted or misapplied. And so scientists try to avoid bias. Um, bias is, again, something that we try to avoid. So how do we prevent it? We prevent it in three ways. We prevent it by sampling, by repetition, and by blind studies. Another question I want you to ask or, uh, answer for me is, what is the placebo effect? Thank you, autocorrect. What is the placebo effect? This is an, another example of bias, and you'll find out your body is so, your brain is so powerful that when it thinks something will help it, will help you, you automatically are helped in, in some ways. It's crazy. But how to prevent, so bias, you know, is a particular point of view. You're closed off to other points of views. For example, um, you know, if you're biased against birds, you automatically think all birds are evil. <laughs> um, uh, politically, you know, certain news organizations are biased towards a certain point of view, whether that's a Republican view or Democratic point of view. And I think we all can see that in the world today. There, there's a lot of bias in the world today. 
but how we don't want that in science so we sample we sample from if we're doing a doing a survey we sample from many different socioeconomic groups we repeat processes over and over again to make sure we have an interpreted data with a slanted viewpoint we do blind studies which means uh, participants don't really know why they're doing something they just sign up uh, understanding we're studying in this area but you know to understand to take out the bias from it okay so biology has some really big ideas and this will be where I close out today's um, video um, biology has some big ideas that interact okay and so these are something that we're going to be talking about all throughout uh, this year so first off the cellular basis of life we are we are made up of cells biology is made up of cells and cells interacting and cells changing you know responding to their environments and therefore the organism changing uh, information like DNA and heredity you know you you inherited genes from your mom and your dad matter and energy we're going to see that flow through organisms we're going to see that growth flow through ecosystems and food webs and food chains um, growth development and reproduction and the necessary uh, factors of all that and how to help organisms grow and develop well um, homeostasis huge theme evolution of course another huge theme um, living things are changing structure and function form leads to function i like to say in anatomy form leads to function unity and diversity of life that's an evolutionary concept um, kind of like the tree of life we're all related um, christianity uh, the bible doesn't really agree with that of course um, we came from the same creator but you're you know the tree of life basically means that we all came from a common ancestor through evolution the bible doesn't teach that interdependence in nature which means living things depend on each other you know uh consumers and, and predators and herbivores and omnivores and there's interactions and food webs and food chains and trees and every you know everything is like a link that's keeping all these systems together and then finally we're trying to understand the world around us we're trying to know the world around us and so it's very important to understand that we um, as scientists, science is constantly changing and, and to be honest, evolving, you know, we're always going to be gathering new data. And so that data is very important to get. So yeah, cellular basis of life, we're made up of cells. And there's DNA again. You know, DNA is shared all across the board. That's why we can have bacteria and grow human proteins. Um, life requires matter and energy. We'll talk a lot about that. Biogeochemical cycles and how energy, once it's used, it cannot be created or destroyed. So once it's used, it's gone. Um, we'll talk about reproduction and homeostasis. And we'll talk about evolution, creation, of course, and evolution. And, and what God says in his word and how science can see that and, um, and how the Bible doesn't contradict science. And, and who was the Bible written to What the and the ancient Near East? We'll talk about all that. Evidence of this shared history. It's found in DNA. Their structure and function. Each group of organisms have evolved its own collection of structures. That, and we'll talk about that, you know, commonalities and analogous structures and homologous structures. And we'll discuss, you know, how form leads to function. So evolutionary theory explains both the unity and diversity of life. And one way to read the Genesis account is God created according to kinds, right? So within kinds, there could be evolution, like the cat kind. Or, you know, the most, you know, science says dogs came from an ancient gray wolf, you know, so we'll, we'll have fun discussions with all that. All forms of life are connected in a bios sphere. Bios means life, of course, sphere, pl living planet. Our planet, in many ways, is a living thing. <laughs> um, it, it houses the biosphere, which is a living part of our planet. All the trees and the plants and the animals and and the organisms on our planet are interacting we're linked to one another of course the ocean is the driving force of this and the oceans are dying um, coral reefs are dying we'll talk about that when we talk about ecology and why it's important to think about the oceans when we're even thinking about our own lives and so one more graphic here and then we'll call this a day scientific methodology methodology scientific method so the job of science is to use observations, questions, and experiments to explain the natural world. And what those explanations do is it can inform society and politicians, hey, here's the data. 
we see that now we see the you know it maybe not working in some areas of the country maybe working in other areas um i'm not very political i think jesus is the answer but we do see that like here's the data but people interpret the data different ways is that considered bias interesting questions to think about we do want to discover we want to keep exploring we're naturally explorers at heart humanity we're naturally curious you know we want to go to mars we want to we want to save the oceans understand what's happening there we want to we want to understand what COVID is and develop a vaccine and help people live we also want to communicate our results so that those results can can be peer tested peer reviewed other people can carry out the experiments and therefore we can give more data to society more opportunities to learn more about the world and thus learn more about life learn more about god learn more about how to take care of us and the planet and living organisms and you know just make life amazing you know so i'll close out with i guess one of my favorite verses um and y'all heard me share it i think john 10 10 jesus is saying jesus says the thief comes only to steal kill and destroy but i've come that you may have life and have it abundantly jesus wants you to have abundant life now he doesn't mean the rich life he doesn't mean a completely healthy life he means a life that he is at the center at and you have peace and joy and the fruits of the spirit that says in galatians love patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness self-control a life that can't be touched by the world because you're secure in knowing that you're jesus is forever jesus wants you to have true life and i hope that you will know that this year so please answer those questions for me please email me the answers by the next time we meet um this is really the majority of chapter one that i want to talk to you about so i hope this video was helpful and i hope you're doing well and thank you for taking this time to watch this um i'll see y'all soon